Okay, you're gonna start ready. Okay, today we're gonna move on to a new chapter. We're gonna dive with enzymes. For those not taking biology and I my class, I'm gonna be doing more class. Okay, today we're starting off with two things. Uh, structure of the cell membrane, as well as what things can pass through the cell membrane. Okay? Um, but I'm going to do a quick recap of where we are so far. Give you a broad idea of what to expect also for your quiz that's coming up. Okay. Have you all seen the announcement of what's going to come up for your quiz? No? Okay, then you're going to find the page right now. Go to Google Classroom. Okay, the announcement has been made of what's going to come up for your quiz. Okay, if you go to your page, Google Classroom page, you scroll down, you should see the topics for your quiz. Okay, so the topics include all the biomolecules that we've done so far. We've got one round of practice through the uh, short, very short quiz that we did. Uh, we also include enzymes, which is which just finished. Okay, and then we're going to go through the cell membrane. Okay, so from here onwards, we're going to talk about the cell already. Okay, under the topic of cells, okay, you encounter a few things. We'll start off first with the cell membrane. After that, we'll go to the nucleus. And uh, something called ribosomes. Okay. And then, can I just give you a broad overview? After that, we will go into an organelle called the endoplasmic. Okay. We will stop here. Okay. This is where your quiz goes up to. Okay. So we are left with a little bit more. Today, we are going to do cell membrane, uh, this week at least. And then after that, the nucleus and ribosomes. And then after that, uh, that's all for your quiz. Can you start your revision? Uh, you can. In fact, you've already started if you if you have been making notes for the quiz that came before this. Yeah? So you should have already made notes for the topic of five of the cues. Okay. So let's link everything together where we have been. Currently in, bio, in biology, we've done biomolecules. Okay. And we've done quite a few biomolecules so far. We started off with lipids. And then we went to carbohydrates. Then we went to nucleic acids. And then finally we went to proteins. Okay. Uh, those were all the parts. All the small, small little things in biology. But right now we're going to start to build a cell. Okay, we're going to go bigger and bigger and bigger. From here, the next few chapters, we're going to talk about the cell. Then, after the June holidays, when we come back in, in term 3, we'll start to go into a large systems. Okay, so from small biomolecules to cell to systems. And two systems we'll cover this year. We'll talk about the transport system in humans and also in plants right and that's where we will end off this year so this is where we are at now but i don't want you to forget everything we've done here because everything we've done here will funnel into how we build ourselves okay so your foundation needs to be strong if you do find that you have trouble for the first few topics you do want to 
uh, spend time uh, revising it, and also look for me if you still have struggle in the first few topics. Okay? From here onwards, everything will build on uh, whatever you've learned so far. Right? So, for today, we're going to focus on how one particular biomolecule can help to build one part of the cell. And that part is the part that you're quite familiar with. In fact, we've accidentally done it before in class. Okay? Today, we're going to see how lipids become cell membrane. Okay? And I hope that this comes in familiar to you if I were to plonk this on the board. Remember this? Yeah? No? Okay, what are the small little biomolecules? What are these for? Okay, just buzz with your neighbor first. Wake yourselves up. Okay? What is this stickman figure called? What are their properties? What's so special about them? Okay, so what is this particular biomolecule called? Phospholipid. What's the special property of phospholipid? Yes. Okay, the word is it is amphipathic. Remember all this? Yeah? It's amphipathic. Which means? Right. Partially hydrophobic, partially hydrophilic. Okay, so we try to recall these terms. Huh? So, this fellow over right here is a phospholipid. And it is hard hydrophilic. The heads are hydrophilic. So sometimes we say it's hydrophilic heads. The tails are hydrophobic. So sometimes we call it the hydrophobic tail. And in one of our CAs, if you cannot remember, you can just scroll back to your CAs. You will find that one of the CAs, we use these phospholipids to build different structures. Right? One of the structures many of us built was like a very round this structure. Something like that. And the reason why we build it this way is because we want the hydrophobic tails to avoid water. Another structure some of us built was this layer like that. Okay? If I were to give you some perspective, this is what the cell membrane actually looks like. So if I were to draw a cell over here, and I just cut a bit of the cell membrane to have a look. Like we zoom in, this is a segment of the cell membrane. We call this a phospholipid bilayer. The word bi means two, layer means a layer. Okay? So bilayer, phospholipid bilayer. We're going to spend our time uh, looking at the phospholipid bilayer today. And that's what the cell membrane is made up of. So, may, uh, just draw your attention up. We will not be spending time on the first set of nodes. So if you look over here, under nodes, okay, I won't be using the first set of nodes. That's, a, that's more of an introduction. We instead go to the second set, where we dive straight into the cell membrane. Okay, so today we're going to spend some time on the membrane structure. Okay, you can stand by also your class activity for today, called Crossing Borders. Okay, and so let's begin with a short video. Here, okay, I think question one a quick read. I'm going to screen a short video uh, in a moment's time to show you what the cell membrane actually looks like.
between. Uh, right, in reality, whatever you see on the whiteboard is in 2D, and you only see things from one perspective. In reality, the cell membrane is a 3D structure. And you can see from different perspectives. Today, you can look at it from another perspective, and you'll see how it's not quite the same as what we put on the whiteboard. Between the living machinery of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell's plasma membrane. As crucial as this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. Push it and watch it move. Poke hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. The lipid molecules of the membrane naturally assemble in a double layer because their tails repel water as their heads attract it. Throw in some cholesterol and a few carbohydrates and you have the basic structure of a plasma membrane. Within these lipid molecules, we also find different proteins which do various things for the cell. For instance, they receive signals from the world outside, or they transport nutrients and waste. So nature composes the membrane with a combination or mosaic of different lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And these molecules are not stationary. They constantly move within the structure, fluidly changing their positions. The survival of all life rests on this veil of material. A supple membrane, just two molecules thick. Right, so it's what the cell membrane really looks like, or at least in animation form. Mm -hmm. Like you now, in your pairs or in, uh, wherever you're sitting next to, have a look at the first question. Scientists often term the cell membrane as having a fluid mosaic model. Why do you think scientists call it uh, a fluid mosaic model? Okay. Two words to break down. Can I get you and your friend to think about it? And I'll ask a few of you to share. Why say that it has a fluid mosaic model? Okay, okay quick discussion. Before. I don't know if you caught. 
Okay, they are a mixture of carbohydrates floating around uh, in the layer and also proteins. So, the cell membrane is not just lipid. Actually, there are a lot of other stuff embedded inside. They can be proteins. Okay, so it's a protein, huh? And these proteins can also float around here and there. Okay? They're not stuck in place. Right? So, not just lipids, natural fat plus some proteins plus some carbohydrates. Okay? And these all contribute to the idea of it being the wrong things to contribute to. So there's fluid. Yeah, this contributes to the idea of it being mosaic. Actually, there are lots of things embedded, not just phospholipid. If it's just phospholipid, it's just a plain tile floor. But there are many, many, many things. Okay? So there are... There are... Okay, and you can list down proteins, carbohydrates, embedded. Okay. These are the various things that can that contributes to that mosaic pattern. What are all these proteins for? The carbohydrates for? We'll come to them in a while as we slowly progress through this chapter. What about the fluid aspect of it? What makes the cell membrane? Why would we say that cell membrane is fluid? Michelle? Sorry? Okay, the proteins and the carbohydrates can move around. They're not quite stuck in place, right? Okay, that, that gives the idea of it being fluid. All these proteins, one might think that they're stuck there. Even over there, it looks like it's stuck because it's, it's just an image. But in reality, we must keep it in mind, keep our minds open that they can flow and move around within the layer. Okay, so the all the parts of the phospholipid bilayer are not static. Okay? Not static. Free to move. I'd like to tell you how they can move. Number one, these things can move laterally. Laterally means for the phospholipid bilayer, it can move no left, right. Okay, that's what it means by laterally. If we look at the phospholipid, so I'm going to put some phospholipids over here. Okay, uh, you may not be able to see it. Okay, so here are the magnets. Uh, if you look at the whiteboard, I'm going to plonk some magnets onto the, onto the layer itself like that. Okay. The phospholipids are the same thing. They can move laterally left and right but on top of that you can also flip flop from layer to layer so a phospholipid at the bottom will flip flop to the top the ones on top can flip flop to the bottom that's how fluid they are these phospholipids so they can also flip flop between the layers that's how fluid the phospholipid bilayer is okay they can move laterally can flip flop. We pause here. I'll take some questions. Yes. Is the cell membrane what? Does it contain chromosomes? Okay. Where? Uh, okay, the, the quick answer is no. But where, where do you think chromosomes can be found? At least what you were thinking. Oh, this one? Orange, like this one? Oh, this one. Okay. Okay, so maybe I'll just direct your attention. Huh? So uh, you, you, you may be wondering, what are these structures coming out? Okay, these structures are the carbohydrates. Okay? You zoom in to your image right now. Can you see that these structures come in a hexagon shape? Like that? Okay? So they're trying to represent sugars. 
So if you ever see these structures made up of hexagon shape, they are actually carbohydrates that are attached to proteins. Okay? So let's say again, I'll zoom in over here to this particular image. All these things over here that are embedded, they are proteins. And then all the things sticking out, these are carbohydrates. How I tell is from the individual sugar units here. So if I were to relate it to maybe this one over here, maybe this is a protein that's embedded, and then here I have a carbohydrate that's sticking out. Okay. Often the carbohydrate is attached to a protein. All these things serve different functions. For example, such a structure may serve as a signaling kind of molecule, helps the cell talk to each other so that they know that they are side by side. Okay, let's do this together. First and foremost, uh, this particular 
activity is all about finding out what bio, what substances can pass through the cell membrane and what can't. Because when we were much younger, I'm very sure your teacher told you that the cell membrane is uh, regulates things that can go in and out. Right? They say that's the function. It can regulate the entry and exit of substances. But the question is, how does it regulate? Well, it regulates by its natural properties. Let's look at the phospholipid bilayer. And let's look at it from the, from the side perspective. This middle portion over here, what kind of property does it have? Is it hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic, huh? And we often call this hydrophobic layer the hydrophobic core. It is a very, very thick layer of fatty acids. So thick that it's like a barrier to a lot of things that want to go through them. Other than the hydrophobic core, we know that the heads are hydrophilic. Okay? With these properties in mind, let's try to figure out what can or cannot pass through the cell membrane. Okay? But with great focus on the hydrophobic core. It's very thick and fat. A very thick fatty layer. This fatty acid layer. Okay, let's try the first one out together. First and foremost, oxygen. Oxygen. What is the structure of oxygen? Are you able to draw the structural formula out? Be so, be so proud. How to draw a structural formula? Oxygen is. Okay, so oxygen is. O, double bond, O. Correct, huh? Correct. Who's the camera here? Okay, show me all the reps, right? So, oxygen. Can you write down the structure? So, we do the first line together, huh? Oxygen. O, double bond, O. Over there. 
You have a question? I like the head is hydrophilic one. Ah, okay. But the head is hydrophilic, right? Okay. So, to, to appreciate the cell membrane, we appreciate that the head is actually pretty small. So that barrier, right, isn't too much of a barrier to pass through. It is the, this thick layer here that is really the barrier. Uh, if if you're looking at molecules but trying to pass through it. What I've done over here, right, in fact, I've made this layer here look quite small. But the fatty acid chains can be pretty long from what we've drawn so far. Okay? So this layer can be really, really thick. Right? So, so anything that's non-polar should be able to pass through the hydrophobic core. So these are the factors I'd like you to keep in mind. What can or cannot pass through the hydrophobic core? Number one, we have to look at polarity. Polarity slash charge. Anything that's non-polar should be able to pass through with ease. Not quite a barrier. Second factor that decides whether something can pass through the cell membrane is size. If something is really small, it can actually pass through the cell membrane quite easily. Oxygen is actually really small. Okay, so it is not only non-polar, it is really, really small. Just think about it, huh? a phospholipid by itself is made up of tons of atoms. Oxygen molecule is just two small little oxygen atoms stuck together. So it's really, really small in comparison to these phospholipids. We also know that the phospholipids are constantly moving here and there. There are always some small little gaps that small little things can sneak their way through. So if you are really small, you can sneak your way through. And if you are non-polar, you can also sneak your way through this very thick layer of fatty acids. Shall we try the next? Yes. Okay, how does it pass through? Okay, now I'm going to bring in something from last, uh, last time you all learned up. Huh? You know the word diffusion? You know the word diffusion before? Okay, so that's how they pass through. Okay, I'm going to write the word diffusion up. Huh? They will pass through diffusion. More specifically, can you write simple diffusion? Okay, they move through simple diffusion. For those that don't know what diffusion means, a quick recap. Diffusion is the idea of things moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay, so they are moving from area of high concentration the area of low concentration. That's what diffusion is. All these circles I'm drawing are just trying to show you that there's more of this thing here, less of it here. Okay, so it's moving from high to low concentration. That's what diffusion is. the next one together. What about carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide goes something like that, right? C O2. Right? Okay, so a quick one. Is carbon dioxide polar, non-polar? Is it small or big? And therefore, how will it pass through the cell membrane layer? Okay, can you try this yourself? Sorry, can you try this with your friend? Okay, is carbon dioxide polar or not polar? Small or big? Therefore, how will it pass through? Can it even pass through?
Yeah, I encourage you to go through the thinking process, huh? Uh, don't just sit there and stare at the whiteboard. Okay, CO2. Polar or non-polar? Right? Polar. Polar. Okay. It's non-polar. Okay, I don't know if your chemistry teacher is so went through this before. Okay, it looks like it's going to be polar, right? Because there's the oxygen and there's the carbon dioxide, right? And then you will expect that oxygen is being drawn to the carbon dioxide. Okay? But actually, when we look at carbon dioxide, it is, if I'm not wrong, linear. I don't know, I'm correct now. Okay, it's linear. The electronegativities kind of cancel off. So actually, overall, the molecule is non polar. Okay? So overall, the molecule is non polar. Okay? So, small or big? Actually, I'll still consider this quite small. Properties still the same, right? Okay. So actually, you can pass through the cell membrane uh, with no problem at all. Okay. Via the simple process of simple diffusion. If you can solve this mystery with your friend, 
Then I will say, uh, you understand this chapter. No, you understand the previous chapters quite well. Okay, I'm going to leave the clues on the whiteboard. I'd like you now to try with your friend. Why do you think glucose cannot pass through the hydrophobic core by itself and needs a helping hand in the form of a protein? Okay, a quick discussion with your friend next door. Okay, apply something, uh, things you've learned from the previous chapter. can't pass through the, the hydrophobic core or the cell membrane uh, directly. Okay, how big is considered big? Great question. Uh, Shucks, I remember researching this before. How big is considered big? Okay, from my observation, uh, it is big, right, when it consists of more than Usually, if it's a biomolecule, it's considered big. Okay? But if, if it is something like an inorganic molecule, this is what we call inorganic. Huh? Inorganic means it doesn't consist of a lot of carbon and hydrogen. So something like this, small amount of oxygen molecule or carbon dioxide, just a few atoms put together, that's still considered small. Okay? So what are you applying here? Too big, okay? Okay, so let's try it. Uh. Internet, you uh, you want to share what you what was in your mind or what you want to discuss? Okay, okay. Uh, glucose has a lot of OH. Okay. So, so therefore it is polar. So what if it's polar? I don't feel it. Oh, okay. The glucose has a lot of polar hydro, uh, hydroxyl groups. Okay? Therefore, it cannot interact with our hydrophobic core. Therefore, it cannot pass through. Keep correct. Okay? That's why you don't find glucose just slipping its way through the hydrophobic core by itself. Other than that, you are mentioning size. Size also matters. Glucose is not as small as these molecules over here. So size also plays a Factor of why it doesn't just pass through by itself through the cell membrane. Okay, but how? Glucose is important. We need sugars to live. All the cells need sugars to live. So how in the world can we bring sugars like this that is polar and big into the cell with the help of proteins? So because such proteins, membrane proteins, Okay. Or sometimes you will see them as transport proteins. As the name implies, their role is to transport things. They okay. transport proteins. If a transport protein is required for the molecule to pass through, okay, we don't call it diffusion anymore. Okay. Okay, we, we add one more word in front. The word is facilitated diffusion. This diffusion needs help. It needs to be facilitated. That's why it's called facilitated diffusion. Whether glucose goes in or out is still dependent on the concentration on either side. But it needs help. It needs some proteins to be able to pass through in the first place. So we say that it is facilitated infusion. Facilitated by what? Facilitated by the proteins in the membrane.
Okay, so that's glucose. We cover a few things that a cell requires to live. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, that's a waste product. Sugars, that's something that we require to live also. Let's try one more substance before we go off today. The last substance is H2O. Will water be able to pass through the cell membrane directly? You can try two things. You could click on the simulation to have a look. Or you can try to make a guess, educated guess, before you click on it. Will water be able to pass through the cell membrane directly? Considering a few factors, polarity, charge, size, do you think it can pass through? If you click on the simulation, then I think you will see the answer. Okay? Okay, we look to the screen. I'm going to play on the simulation now for those that have not watched. Can water pass through the cell membrane? Yes, it can. Okay, but it can also make use of proteins. So you see again, uh, yes, it can pass through the cell membrane, but it can also make use of proteins. Okay, so, get out, get out. Man. Number one, water is polar as a molecule. But because its size is very, very small, it can actually still pass through the cell membrane. Okay, it's very, very small, water molecules. It can still pass through the cell membrane, even though it's polar. But I have to let you know that because it is polar, it doesn't pass through the cell membrane very fast. Okay? It passes through at a slow rate because it is polar. But that's not a very good thing because our cells need water to survive. Yet it passes through so slowly. And that is why water molecules also make use of proteins to pass through the cell membrane. Because if it makes use of proteins to pass through the cell membrane, it is much faster rate when it passes through proteins. Okay. What's the process that we term when water moves? I don't know if you still remember this from your lower GH years. It's actually not called diffusion. It starts with an O. You remember? It starts with an O. Okay. Osmosis. Huh? So when we describe water moving, we don't say diffusion. We use the word osmosis. Water moves through the cell membrane via osmosis at a very slow rate because it's polar. But it can move at a very fast rate via osmosis when it goes through proteins. Okay, so that's the takeaway for today. We don't call it facilitated diffusion, huh? even though it requires proteins. Scientists also don't call it facilitated osmosis. I don't know why. There's no such term as facilitated osmosis. Okay, there's a name for this protein. Can you take note of the name? The name is called aqua chlorine. The word aqua means water. Chlorine means like a pore, like a hole in the, in the cell membrane. It's called aqua chlorine. Okay, with that, we've, uh, we've uh, covered a few biomolecular uh, substances today and how they travel through the cell membrane. Before I meet you for lessons tomorrow, I would like you to complete the last two sodium, eh, last two? No, last one, sodium ions. Can you complete sodium ions? Can you find out how sodium ions will pass through the cell membrane? 
Can he pass through the cell membrane by itself? Or will he require a little bit of help? Why will he require help? Or why won't he require help? Okay, please cover that by tomorrow and I will see you in the lab tomorrow. Can I? You right? You mind helping me stop my iPhone? Okay, that's all for today. If you have any questions, feel free to text me after class or look for me anytime.